Well, good morning. I don't know if you guys could hear that. I was going to crank that one up, but try to wake you guys up this morning. It's good to see you guys today. Pastor Steve, I have never in my life had to be less energetic than someone else on stage, but we're glad you're a grandpa and we know you're excited about that. Have you decided, are you going to be a papa, uh, a grandpa, a old man, whatever else we call grandpas? Have you figured out the name yet? What they're going to call you? Father, Father grandfather, <laughs> grandfather. I like it. Anyway, good morning. Today we're going to talk about how love reigns over our past. And I love that video of looking at life with brand new glasses. And if you haven't seen that movie, it's called Free Guy. It's PG. Uh, but, uh, uh, but a great point, which is the idea that sometimes we don't really see what's going on around us. And you and I need to realize when you become a Christian, you are in a spiritual battle. Now, before you become a Christian, you're in a spiritual battle, but the truth is the enemy's not too worried about you. He's got you right where he wants you. The way you see life, you think is just right. And, and it's not a big deal. But when the Holy Spirit begins to work on you and you become a Christian, the Bible has several things that talk about how you become a new person. But here's what the enemy will do to you. He will drag in your past things you've done before. Have you ever had that moment I had the other night where I was sleeping and I woke up and my mind had an entire movie going about something dumb that I had done years ago. Any of you ever have that happen? You got that whole movie playing and every once in a while it replays for no reason. And usually, I'll be honest with you, it's not an encouraging movie. Very rarely do we go back to that wonderful time in the middle of the night and I remember that great time. No, no, no. What do we remember? Oh man, I can't believe I did that or said that in public or this happened. One of our youth was telling me just the other night, they said something in public and other kids made fun of them. And I instantly went back to junior high when I stood up in an auditorium in front and made a fool of myself in front of 400 other students. Just, just really. Now, in hindsight, now I can look back and go, well, Eric, that's, you're just a kid, blah, blah, blah. But the truth is, I have replayed that moment. Any of you, you've done that, right? Now, here's what the enemy will do to you. He will try to get you to constantly look at life with the wrong glasses. Because when you become a Christian, God gives you a whole new perspective, a whole new way of looking at life. But the enemy will constantly, no matter how long you've been a Christian... He will constantly give you these old glasses to try to make you think, oh, remember when you did that? You are a failure. You are a doofus. You are a whatever is negative. And then God comes and tells you who you really are. So I want to encourage you today as we look at this idea of, of love reigning over our past. I, I just want to remind you that there's a spiritual battle that kind of makes you look at your past, maybe makes you compare yourself to others instead of receiving what God has done for you. So we're going to talk today about how you can overcome your past because His love reigns. He paid for your past. He makes you new. And you can live in Him and love others. So we're going to talk about that today. So we're going to start with, because Jesus loves us. Now, if you've never read John 3.16, you should. It is the gospel in just one verse. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever, whoever, doesn't say just the elect. It says whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. So the idea of that verse is God loves us. When's the last time that you woke up in the middle of the night with this thought? God really loves me. Probably not. Because the enemy constantly plants other thoughts in our minds. So I want to give you this first set of glasses and talk about what the enemy does. The, the first thing he does is he, he makes us look at, boy, I can't even see that. He makes us look at who we were, who I was, who I was. And so he'll remind us, and by the way, those glasses aren't rose colored like these. I stole one of my kids' glasses. I don't know 
whose glasses they are yet. It was a little Facebook photo post there. I don't know whose glasses these are, but one of my kids will call me this afternoon and say, what are you doing using my glasses? To which I will say, you left them out. Right? Very dad thing. So what the enemy does is he always reminds us of who we were. So he will remind you of every mistake you ever made. And any time you go to help somebody or encourage somebody or bless somebody or even just leave your house, he'll remind you of something you did in your past, some failure you had, some mistake you had, the, maybe even the way you thought, maybe the way you grew up, maybe something somebody told you when you were a kid, and you may not even be aware of it. I, I know people who are geniuses who struggle with, I feel like a failure. I know people that if you looked at them, you would say, wow, they are a huge success. And yet they tell themselves all the time, I'm a failure. I'm broken. And so I want to look at what the Bible says about how he paid for our past. Because Jesus paid for your past. You no longer have to live your life with the glasses that say all you are. And look back at that movie. You know the movie I'm talking about. The movie where I hit the guy with a shot put in high school. That is a horrible story. The movie where I dropped the cymbals during a concert. The movie where I said that horrible thing to that person in high school and I replay it. Oh no, I should have been nicer to them. All of those things play. Our past comes back. And for those of us who've lived a past where we've made a lot of mistakes, the enemy loves to bring those up. But let's see what the Bible says. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. For Christ's love compels us because we're convinced that one died for all. That's a substitutionary atonement is what that's called. That's a big term for he took our place. And therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So what's it say? Jesus died for your sins. So why do you keep going back and saying, but I got to pay for them again by feeling guilty, by feeling shame, by continually looking at what I did and going, oh man. The enemy wants to do that. Why? Because he doesn't want you to live in God's presence. He doesn't want you to live in God's forgiveness. He wants you to live in sin and shame and failure. If you think that's the only verse, listen to Colossians 1. These are both written by a guy named Paul. I'll talk about him in a second. Once you were aliens from God. I like aliens instead of alienated. But it's true. We were totally foreign. We were alienated from God and we were enemies in our minds. Why? Because of our evil behavior. But now he has, listen to this word, reconciled you. Anybody who deals with the books knows what that means. You, you, you zero it out. You reconcile the books. There's, there's no more debt there. He reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you, listen, holy in his sight. Without blemish, and listen, listen to this last one, free from accusation. Time out, time out. Listen, do you hear that free from accusation? This is written by a guy named Paul. Paul killed Christians. He was in on killing Christians all over the place. One of the stories specifically we're told is about the first deacon named Stephen who was stoned to death. And as he died, he said, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father, to which they all began screaming and killed him with giant rocks. Stoning was not usually small rocks. It was rocks. And I'm sure there were nights that Paul woke up and he saw one of the Christians that he had dragged away from their family and stoned to death. Christians in that time by the Romans were burned to death sometimes. I am certain that any nightmare you've had about a failure, that Paul had a worse nightmare. Because he could see the faces of those he killed. And I'm sure the enemy came to him and said, Who do you think you are to write letters to the very people whose families you killed? And then Paul says, hey, you no longer stand on the side of accusation. 
Not because you're good enough or smart enough or have it together enough, but because when you ask for forgiveness from sin, when you repented from your sins, the Bible says he cleansed you. And Paul, more than anybody, knew that. Don't you have something in your past that comes up now and then, and you think, oh. And then it continues. Without blemish, free from accusation, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and don't move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel. Gospel means good news that you heard and has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which, I love this, I, Paul, have become a servant. So Paul says, there's no more accusation in Christ, and I just want you to know, if anybody could be accused, it's Paul. So you don't recognize when you're reading the Bible, the heroes in the Bible are all failures who God restored. Every one of them. That's one of the biggest differences about the Bible and any other religion, as you look at the Bible itself, you recognize that the Bible's very clear that all the heroes fail and fall and falter, but the ones that repent, He restores. And so what do we need to do? Well, when we go through life and the enemy's just accusing us for no reason of sins we've already confessed, we say, God, there's no accusation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We remind Him of what the Bible says. But then there are times, if we're honest, that even though we're new creatures in Christ, we fail and falter. We still say dumb things sometimes. Why? Those old habits hang on. Sometimes we still do things that the Bible calls sin. And so what do we do? The Bible says if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. And then it says, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what do we do? God, I've been... In this area of my life, I've been sinning. I confess it to you. Lord, I've been mad at that person. I haven't forgiven that person. I've been paying attention to this wrong thing. I've been focused on this. Lord, forgive me for wrong priorities. And then when the enemy reminds you, yeah, but you did that last week. You know what you say? There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.1. God, I I don't always get it right. Those old habits come up. But I'm not who I used to be. Quit wearing the glasses that say you're who you were. By the way, you ready? Everybody struggles with that. I don't care if you're 8 or 80. Everybody struggles with the enemy bringing up their failures. The enemy bringing up their shortcomings. All the things that happen. So I want to encourage you when that happens. Oh, let me give you two things that you need to know in this. This will help you. Conviction is when God shows you a sin in your life and you can do something about it. Okay? So, for example, let's say I was mean to Steve this week, which could have happened. I don't, I'm not aware of it. But, but, and let's say the Holy Spirit, I was praying one morning and, and the Lord reminded me, Hey, you know, you said that to Steve this week and you really ought to go and apologize. So I go and I make that right with Steve, right? And I ask God to forgive me, and it's done. That's conviction. You can do something about conviction. But there's something called condemnation. The enemy comes to you with condemnation. And the big difference is you can't do anything about that. Condemnation is, boy, you're dumb. Uh, can't really fix that. Boy, you're hyper and nobody likes you. Hey, you're this way, people hate your guts, right? Accusations, things you can do nothing about. That is from the enemy. Conviction is, this is what you did, and you need to make it right. Condemnation is, you're a dumb person. You're a terrible father. You're a terrible grandfather. You're an awful, you can't do anything about that. Specific and general. Remember that God is specific with your sins, and when we confess those, He makes it right. When the enemy comes to you in condemnation, just remind yourself of what the Bible says about who you are now. You're washed in the blood. You're a new creation. There's no condemnation. There's verse after verse after verse. And take these dumb glasses off. All right, let's go to the next pair of glasses. Here we go. Number two. He makes us new. He makes us new. 
new. Now, I'm going to show you how this happens in our lives so often. What the enemy does is even though God made us new, he gives us these what I have glasses. And what I have glasses look like this. Well, I've got this, or this is how I am, but look how God's using them. And so what happens with what I have glasses is this. We either look at other people and say, man, I wish I had that. Man, they're such a good Christian. I'll never be like that. Or, <laughs> or we look at somebody and we say, wow, at least I don't do that. Boy, I'm so much better than they are. Both of those are wrong. Why? Because you're wearing the glasses that say what I have. We think it's about what we have compared to other people. And so we're constantly comparing what... Oh, here you go. Okay. So we're constantly comparing what I have to what other people have. And it either makes us arrogant or we start playing the old movies again, right? We go back to, I wish I was this. I wish I was that. And he, the enemy's really smart. So here's what happens when you look at somebody else and, and you sit, think, wow, look what they have. The enemy will then say, well, you would have that if it wasn't for you being fill in the blank. And what can you do about it? Nothing. Now you're unsatisfied. You're maybe arrogant about your strengths over somebody else's weaknesses. Or you're defeated because you compare your weakness to somebody else's strength. And you think, I'll never be that. And as long as you're wearing those glasses and don't understand that he makes you new. You don't recognize that you're not, listen, you're not supposed to be someone else. Let me say that again. You're not supposed to be someone else. So if I look at a church today that has four people, I'm not able to say, oh, our church is so much better because we got more than four people. Or when I look at a church that has 10,000 people this morning, I'm not able to say, oh man, what is, I, I, you know, I'm just a failure because God hasn't brought 10,000 people here. Hey, you're a new creation. And guess what? Your new creation is you. It's not somebody else. You do what God's called you to do. Don't be called to what somebody else does. Listen to what he says here in, in 2 Corinthians 5, 16 to 19. From now on, regard no one from this worldly point of view, which means comparison, right? The world compares all the time. That's why we have TV shows, right? They're comparing people all the time. That's what ESPN even now is a comparison tool, which is crazy. It says, though once we regarded Christ this way, we don't do any longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. You're no longer who you were, which is what we talked about. You are, but listen, you are who you are. And God loves you right where you are. You don't have to be somebody else. You don't have to be better than somebody else. You don't have to feel like, well, I don't have that, so therefore God's punishing me. That person has a lot of money, therefore I'm being punished. Or, boy, that person doesn't have anything, they're being punished. No, I'm a new creation in Christ, and then it continues, the the old has gone, the new is here, all this is from God, and we go back to this word, who reconciled, that's that zeroing out, us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Here's the deal. When you recognize what Jesus has done for you and he's made you a new creation, you ready? You're not threatened by other people any longer. You're also not arrogant towards them. So when you're dealing with people, you recognize God made me a new creation. <gasps> and he can make you a new creation. God restored me. Listen, when I was a kid, one of my favorite, we didn't have a pool at my house. And one of my favorite things when Todd Vernon would come down the street and he could be a doofus sometimes, you know, like all of us. And, and he would say, hey guys, you want to come over? We're going to play Marco Polo. And he would cheat. <laughs> but we got to swim in his pool. So we were excited. We couldn't wait to come because he had a pool and we didn't. And he said, come over to our pool. And we went, 
pool time, woohoo! One day, we got, they filled up the pool. They drained it one time. I'll never forget sitting in the bottom of that pool and the water coming out and they, our voices echoed off the side. I mean, it was awesome. We were like, who's the coolest thing ever? And he invited us over. Listen, when you recognize what God has done for you and you really get a hold of it and you're not comparing yourself to everybody else, it makes you much better at inviting people to the same thing. Because they're excited to have what you have. One of the reasons that Christianity is not so attractive is because we sometimes put on these comparison glasses. So we're constantly gossiping. We're constantly comparing ourselves to others. We're putting people down who aren't like us. Maybe there's a few things they don't do that we do. And so we say, oh, we're better than them because we don't struggle with that. Or they look at us and all we say is, well, I'm just a failure. I'm a sinner. Listen to what it says in this next passage here. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8 and 10 through 11. Paul again. But since we belong to the day, let's be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. What's he talking about? Our thoughts. The hope of salvation. No matter what you wake up, whatever movie plays in your head when you wake up, that salvation over, overrides it. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath. Listen but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we're awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another, build each other up as just in fact you're doing. There's a guy in our Rotary Club that's like 99 years old. He's a sea captain. And he was transporting troops during World War II, very to a very dangerous job, and some troops were having a party. His name's Captain Ed. The troops were having a party, some of them on the front of his ship. And he said, everybody needs to come inside, but they were having a good time. So they stayed on the front, and one of them went overboard. And they all took off and headed to their rooms for over an hour and a half until one of them finally felt so guilty, they went up and said, hey, Captain Ed, just so you know, somebody went overboard. He's like, what? When? Hour and a half ago. What? So he turned the ship around, looked up the nautical charts, figured out which way the waves were going, figured out which way the wind was going, and went back. And guess what? He found her, which is amazing. Dropped a, a rowboat over the side or whatever kind of boat they had back then. The, they got her in. The, by the way, she refused to get in the boat until he gave her a, this is the old days, gave her a, a cloth to put around her. She got in the boat back on the ship. Now, listen. What if once she got in the ship, she kept looking at everybody and going, I'm drowning. I don't know why she'd do the doggy paddle, but let's just suppose, I'm drowning. You'd be like, um, did you get hit in the head? Because you're not drowning anymore, right? If you're a believer and you continue to say, I'm just a sinner. No, you're not. Quit saying that. It's a lie. Because here's the deal. If you're a believer, you are no longer a sinner. What? What do you mean, Eric? You're a sinner who was saved by God's grace. There is a big difference. When you say you're a sinner, you're saying you're still in the water. That you haven't been rescued yet. But if you're a believer, guess what? You've been rescued. So you are a sinner saved by grace. You're no longer drowning. Quit saying you're drowning. That's weird. And yet we're so used to it that we just say it. Now, do I sin sometimes? Absolutely. We put our foot in the water all the time. And we have to repent. But that's very different than the fact that you are now saved. You are now sanctified. God has saved you. When the enemy comes to you and tries to remind you of who you were, give thanks right now. When that movie plays in your mind, when you begin to compare yourself to other people, just take time to give thanks right now. You know, the world practices something called mindfulness. The Bible practices something called thankfulness, which makes you aware of all you've been given. Yes, you have some lack in your life. This is the world. The only time you won't have lack is when you get to heaven. The day you wake up and go, oh, I have no lack. There's nothing missing. Then you should say, oh, hi, Jesus. What are you doing here? Right? And so the truth is, sometimes in this life, we just give thanks for what he's given us, who he's made us to be. Number three, 
Not only did he pay for our past, not only does he make us new, we can live in him and love others. This is the who I am now glasses. So who are you now? If I asked you, who are you? Do you put on the old glasses? And all you talk about is your failures, the things where you've messed up? Do you compare yourself to everybody else when I talk about who you are? Well, I just know. Uh... One of my biggest struggles is I'm super hyper. I know that's a shocker to you guys. And, and Kristen always says, but that makes you funny and entertaining. I go, but you have no idea. In my mind, it is frustrating. Because there are times that I really would love to go A, B, C, D. And instead I go A, D, C, K, J, Z, L, P, Q, T, S, P. There's P again, right? It's frustrating. And it's easy for me sometimes to say, you know, It'd be nice to be one of these pastors that could get up on Sunday and go, Now, God, today we're going to discuss the Bible. Look at Romans chapter 8. Would you turn your Bibles? Let's stand as we read the scripture this morning. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in. Right? But if I'm honest, there's times that I listen to somebody like that and I say, I wish I could be like that. I, I, I wish I was a little more. Don't you ever say, I wish I was a little more? So what do we have to do when that happens? Remember who we are. Wrong, wrong ones. Remember, I got too many glasses. You want these. Remember who I am now. Who God has made you now. Here's what it says. We can... Live in him and love others. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors from God to others as though we were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin, what? To be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now it sounds arrogant instead of saying I'm a sinner to say I'm righteous. Or if you're a surfer, righteous, right? But the truth is, the Bible says it. So when you're reminded of your failures, you say, yeah, but God's made me righteous anyway. But you're like this, but God's made me righteous anyway. But you do this, but God's made me righteous anyway. But you fail here, but God's made me righteous anyway. Why? Because of my faith in Jesus. Not because I'm good enough or smart enough or have my act together enough or I'm better than somebody else or worse than somebody else. It's because he made me new and I am who I am and he Paid it all. And I'm so thankful for that. Dear friends, let us love one another. First John 4. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. Why? Because God's love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world. Why? That we might live through him. Anytime you're putting these old glasses on, what are you doing? You're dying. You're reliving past mistakes. You're allowing the old sins of your life to drag you down and you feel like you're dying. But we can live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Why? Because we had a debt and God in his justice had to have the debt paid, but we couldn't pay it. So he paid it for us. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one's ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. You know, you know what he's saying here? People will see God in you. When you recognize that it's not about who you were, this can be your story to tell people what you've overcome, but this should not be the lens you look through now. You, when you're not comparing yourself to other people all the time, then guess what? You can actually love people. When you're not trying to be better than them. When you're not thinking you're in competition with them. When you don't look at them and say, they're better than me, then you can love them. If you don't look at them and saying they're worse than me, then you can love them. Because that's what we're called to do. When we recognize that God has torn down the old, and given us his righteousness, not because we deserved it, then we can love other people the way he has. I want to encourage you. 
Live in Him, not in you. Don't let your past, don't let the enemy give you the glasses of your past. But know who He's made you to be. And today, as you look at people, when the enemy puts the old glasses on and you start comparing, or you start thinking they should be this way, or you start thinking, "Uh, I'm an idiot, take those glasses off and recognize I'm a new creation in Christ. My past is gone. All things have become new. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, that's the promise of salvation. Is that he takes our old nature, our old ways, he puts it to death and gives us his life. If you want to do that today, I'll be here after the service. If you're watching online, I'd love to talk to you after the service. You can email me or text me. If you're here today and you're a Christian, but you recognize some of these voices, hey, just be honest with God, confess it to him, make it right, and say, God, thank you that I'm a new creation in you. Let's close in prayer today. Father, I thank you for your word, your power, your strength, your love for us. I pray that we could put the glasses on of who I am now. Lord, I thank you for the righteousness you've given us. Not because we've earned it, but because you love us. Father, I pray if anyone in here doesn't know you, that today would be the day they surrender their lives to you. Thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen.